All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first things first, I wanted to thank everybody for coming uh, all the way out here at five o'clock on the first day of build. I know it's been a busy day. Hopefully there's been a lot of really good information, a lot of good news for everybody. My name's Jason Ronald. I'm the head of the Xbox Advanced Technology Group. And I'm here today to talk to you guys about the future of game development on Windows. For those of you guys who don't know, uh, the Xbox Advanced Technology Group has been working uh, with the best game developers across the world over the last 15 years to really make sure that our development partners are taking full advantage of all the hardware, software, and services that we provide to game developers. And we also act as the voice of game developers across Microsoft to make sure that the platforms that we're building are, taking, are really optimized for the needs of game developers. So I'm here today to talk to you through sort of where we see game, game development going on Windows 10 and how you can take advantage of it. So before we talk about the future, I think it's important to first look back at 2015. And 2015 really was an incredible year in Xbox history. So first and foremost um, was the Windows 10 launch. And with the Windows 10 launch from the gaming division's perspective, this was really about a recommitment to delivering a great gaming experience on PC. And that includes everything such as the release of the Universal Windows platform, the addition of DirectX 12, a new next generation graphics API that allows game developers to really take advantage of the hardware, and then bringing Xbox Live to Windows 10 and all Windows 10 devices to make sure that we have a connected ecosystem of devices so that game developers can provide their content uh, on any uh, device in the ecosystem. And then we also added a whole series of consumer features, such as the Xbox app, bringing your Xbox social graph uh, and sort of your achievements and your gamer history to the PC, as well as the game bar, which comes up over every game uh, on Windows 10. So you can do things such as recording uh, game DVR clips and then posting them to your social network. And we've seen massive adoption and engagement of Windows 10 uh, in the gaming space and across the industry. As we announced this morning, we have more than 270 million active devices running Windows 10 uh, today. We've seen more than 4 billion hours of PC games played on Windows 10. So there's a huge addressable audience and a very engaged audience. And gaming is a, one of the biggest activities that we see on Windows 10. We've got more than 10 million hours of streaming games from Xbox One to Windows 10. So that way, if your TV's uh, occupied, uh, by somebody else in the household who's actually watching a television show or something like that, you can still have your gaming experience streamed directly from your Xbox One to any Windows 10 device. And then on the storefront, we're seeing a significant increase in paid transactions and revenue per device, really showing that the introdu introduction of the Windows Store onto Windows 10 is really a great opportunity for game developers to monetize content on our platform. And we can't really talk about the 2015 without talking about what we also did on the console. So last November, we released the new Xbox One experience. And this is when we really brought Windows 10 to Xbox One with a brand new UI and a brand new interface, uh, really based on the feedback that we've gotten from our players. And then we also introduced Xbox 360 backwards compatibility. And this is really about giving gamers the confidence that when you buy a game digitally through uh, our services, that it'll be available to you uh, moving forward. And it's really important that consumers have a really uh, positive impression of you know, digital licensing because that's really where all the content's moving towards. And then we've also seen significant growth in Xbox Live last holiday. Uh, we now have more than 48 million monthly active users on Xbox Live. And those users are deeply engaged and they participate in our ecosystem very heavily. And over the holiday break, we bro broke an all-time Xbox Live peak concurrency record. Um, and as we've seen the stats from the first part of this year, we're continuing to grow month over month, and we have more and more active users on the service. And then from the developer's perspective, we've made a lot of key improvements last year as we started bringing some of these new titles online. We've made UWP much better optimized for the needs of game development. Game development is fundamentally different than saying writing a social app or writing a media app or a line of business app. So we've been working really closely across all the teams at Microsoft to really make sure UWP is a great environment for game development. And then with DirectX 12, DirectX 12 is really about pushing the limits of uh, visual quality and fidelity 
across all the devices in the ecosystem because DirectX 12 works on most of the existing GPUs that people have in their PCs at home. And it's really about getting more performance out of their existing hardware as opposed to getting brand new hardware. Um, and then Xbox Live support is now ubiquitous across all Windows devices. So when we talk about a cross-device connected ecosystem that puts the player at the center, Xbox Live is our gaming social graph. It is our uh, gaming network. And it's critically important that it's always available to you as a developer and to uh, the players on our service. And we can't really talk about you know, uh, gaming on our platforms without focusing on the games themselves. And as somebody who's worked in Team Xbox for the last decade, I can honestly say that Last Holiday was the greatest lineup that we've ever had in Xbox history. Everything from Forza Motorsport 6 and Metal Gear Solid 5 to The Witcher 3, Star Wars Battlefront, Fallout 4. There's just, there were great games week after week releasing um, on both Xbox One and on Windows 10. And it's really to the credit of everybody in rooms like this, the best game developers all across the world. And we really, as Team Xbox, want to make sure that we say thank you to everybody uh, in this room, because without your support, we wouldn't be here today. People don't buy uh, operating systems or game consoles to experience the Dash experience, they do it to play games. So more than anything, I just really want to make sure that we say thank you to everybody uh, for all your continued support and feedback uh, on how we can make the platform better and delivering your content on our platforms. So let's talk about the road forward. So when we think about the road forward, first and foremost, we focus on the games that we're bringing across the devices in our ecosystem. And we've got a very large portfolio across our first party, our third party, and our ID at Xbox uh, partners, all coming to Windows 10 or Xbox One. And some of these titles uh, you've probably heard about, we referenced some of these uh, earlier today in the keynote, everything from Gears of War Ultimate Edition to Ori and the Blind Forest Definitive Edition, to other titles that are yet to come out, such as Quantum Break, which is scheduled to release uh, next week. Um, and it's really about providing rich, great, innovative content to our players. Uh, at GDC 2015, we shared this slide where we talked about our journey to one platform. And that one platform is Windows 10 across all devices in our ecosystem. And we come from a world where Writing a game on the Windows desktop was fundamentally different than writing a game for the Windows phone, or taking advantage of Xbox One, trying to move that code over to the Windows desktop was actually really, really difficult. So what we've been doing over the last couple of years is really uh, uh, solidifying and making sure that we deliver, deliver one core OS, one app platform, one store, one set of services that are available across all the devices in the ecosystem. So this really makes it easier for you as a game developer to write your game and then make a decision about what devices you want to actually target. And then the other aspect of it as well is it introduces brand new devices that we've never even uh, thought of. When we started down this journey, HoloLens was just an idea. We didn't understand sort of what the gaming opportunities were. There's a whole series of uh, IoT devices that are, coming up, uh, that are coming out that have interesting scenarios uh, for gaming. Um, and there's tons of other ideas that people all across the world have. And by betting on this one core OS, this one app platform, this one store, and this one set of services, it really gives you the flexibility to target your content in the way that's most natural to your players. So let's talk about the Universal Windows platform. So the first wave of UWP-based uh, titles are shipping now. Uh, we've already shipped Rise of the Tomb Raider, Gears of War Ultimate Edition, and just yesterday we shipped Killer Instinct Season 3. And these are all you know, high-profile franchises that you're used to seeing on the console. They're now shipping on Windows 10, all based on the Universal Windows platform. And then we have a whole series of titles shipping soon. Like I said, Quantum Break is scheduled to ship next week. We have Ori and the Blind Forest Definitive Edition. And this morning, if you saw the keynote, you saw a, a testimonial from the Forza Motorsport 6 Apex team talking about how they leverage UWP to deliver that uh, similar Forza experience that you've come to expect, but at a new level of fidelity on the PC beyond what we've even been able to do on the console. And there's many, many more in active development. And through working with these partners very closely over the last 12 to 18 months, we've made significant improvements for developers when it comes to UWP. 
For example, we've significantly expanded the API surface area for game scenarios. There was a number of APIs that are not as commonly used in, say, line of business apps or media apps that are absolutely essential to game developers. So we've worked with the teams to actually make those APIs available and at the exact same performance that uh, you'd see with a traditional Win32 game. The other thing, too, is we've significantly improved the packaging and, and ingestion process for AAA scale games. Most AAA scale, game, AAA scale games can range anywhere from 50 to 80 gigs, if not even larger. And the needs of how do I package that, how do I submit these builds, there was a lot of really big challenges that we had to solve, um, and we've been partnering very closely with these titles to make that better. And then we continue to partner closely with key engine and middleware providers, because at the scale of games that we're talking about, almost all of them use various levels of middleware uh, from a number of different companies. So we've been working very closely with these partners to make sure that those engines and the, that middleware is optimized for UWP. It takes advantage of the capabilities of UWP. So the same middleware that you use on the console is the same version that you use on Windows 10 and so on. So it, once again, it's one application platform that you can count on that gives you the flexibility to target your content more directly at different device types. And then, as we said this morning, we're listening to feedback. The feedback from our developers and gamers are critical to our success. And to be clear, as a member of Team Xbox, the feedback that we get from the gaming community and the game development community directly influences our plans and our uh, roadmap. So this morning, Phil announced that uh, later uh, in a couple weeks, we'll be releasing an update that adds the ability for a title to disable vSync and support for G-Sync and FreeSync monitors. These are fundamental things that PC gamers expect to work, and we're adding that support as fast as we possibly can. We also have additional UWP updates coming later this summer, that, and some of which we talked about this morning, and some of which we'll talk about uh, later this summer, because we're committed to making UWP a great game development platform, regardless of what device you're targeting. Uh, and that feedback from both the gaming community and from game developers is uh, foundational to how we approach this. On the graphics side, uh, with Windows 10, we introduced DirectX 12. And like I said before, this is a common next generation graphics API that works across PC and console. So once again, you have one set of APIs that you can call and really take advantage of the hardware that's accessible to you. And this gives you direct access to the GPU hardware to deliver the highest performance possible, much higher performance than you were able to get with DirectX 11. But one of the big improvements with uh, DX12 is it significantly reduces the CPU overhead as compared to DX11. So we've seen with some of our early titles up to a 50% CPU improvement and up to a 20% GPU perf improvement as compared to DX11. So with that, extra over, uh, with that extra CPU power and the extra GPU power that's available to you, you can now go ahead and push the boundaries even further, whether it's making more dynamic worlds, adding more characters, or just really you know, pushing the boundaries of what's possible on uh, your rendering techniques. And then we've seen extremely strong partner support for DX12. Um, as an example, Ashes of the Singularity, the latest Hitman title, Gears of War Ultimate Edition, and Rise of the Tomb Raider have all shipped with full DX12 support. And then last holiday, Star Wars Battlefront was the first title to ship on Xbox One taking advantage of DX12. Um, so by putting these uh, capabilities in the hands of the best developers, we're starting to see the results now that uh, more and more titles are releasing taking advantage of these capabilities. And then on the DirectX 12 front, we're continuing to partner very closely with the IHV uh, providers, such as in NVIDIA, AMD, and Intel, and we're making significant improvements in the PC DX12 drivers. Since some of these titles have released, uh, our IHV partners have released a number of driver updates, as well as we've released a number of title updates, to really optimize and really take advantage of the hardware that's available. Also, DirectX 12 introduced explicit multi-GPU support, which is a new capability that we didn't have with DirectX 11. And we support both linked and unlinked uh, multi-GPU scenarios. So the way you can think about linked GPU scenarios is this is effectively the same GPU, so you can think about it like an SLI or a Crossfire setup. Or you can even do unlinked, and this is basically heterogeneous GPUs. So if you have 
uh, a discrete graphics card in your computer, but you also have an integrated graphics card, developers can now take advantage of that extra GPU power and uh, go ahead and dispatch rendering to both GPUs to get as much power out of uh, the existing hardware that you have. And to be clear, this is supported in both Win32 and UWP today. This is a core functionality in DirectX 12. It has nothing to do with the app model. So developers can take advantage of this regardless of what app model you choose to use. Ashes of the Singularity is actually taking advantage of uh, the majority of these multi-GPU scenarios or features today. Um, and then Gears of War Ultimate Edition will be shipping uh, an update soon, uh, adding multi-GPU support. Um, so this is absolutely something that PC gamers have come to expect, and as game developers, it's critical that we're able to provide the best experience possible for all of our players, regardless of what hardware they have. As we look forward with DirectX 12, there's a new and improved shader compiler, as well as Shader Model 6 that we're introducing. There was a deep dive uh, about two weeks ago at GDC 2016 uh, that, is, that is available up on Channel 9 if you want to know, know more details about the new Shader compiler and the new capabilities that are coming in Shader Model 6. And then the other thing as well is we're adding PC support for some of the same performance tools that we use on Xbox today. If you've ever made an Xbox One title, uh, we have a tool called PIX, or the Performance Investigator for Xbox. And this is really what all the best game developers in the industry use to really optimize the rendering path and their overall game performance. Uh, and we've gotten constant requests over the years to add uh, native PC support, so that'll be coming later this year. So that as a developer, the exact same tools you use on console are now available on PC and vice versa. Similarly, as we dedicate resources to continuing to improve this uh, set of tools, you'll get the same benefit regardless of whether or not the original intention was focused on the PC developer or on the console developer. Another area that we're really interested in and we're seeing exciting results uh, with uh, in the graphics space is high dynamic range and wide color gamut. Uh, if any of you guys paid attention to CES 2016, uh, all the major TV manufacturers and monitor manufacturers have made commitments to adding HDR and wide color gamut support to all their future TVs moving forward. And part of the reason for that is it really delivers a next generation uh, set of image quality and image fidelity that we've never seen before. If you've never seen an HDR display in person, I, I can attest like the, the visual difference is stunning. And what it really allows you to do with the, the high dynamic range and the wider color gamut is to really pick up super fine details that today are lost due to the fact that we have to clamp and compress our color palettes. So what we've seen with the early uh, prototypes and investments that we've done in this space is the HDR and wide color gamut actually means much more to a player than the actual resolution of the experience because it's the ability to perceive those finer details that really comes through uh, and that's much more impactful than native resolution. So when we talk about high dynamic range, um, so uh, today we use a standard called Rec 709 to do our color calibration. Um, and with HDR, we've in, there's a new standard called Rec 2020. So we, when we look at the high dynamic range, today Rec 709 basically de defines a brightness level or a luminance level between effectively 0 0.1 and 100. And this is really the standard that we've been using for the last you know, 50 plus years with televisions. Um, but if you see the, the spectrum with Rec 2020, we can now go as low as 0 .001, actually lower, all the way up to 10,000 nits. And what a nit is, is a nit is basically the level of luminance that the actual display is able to output. In practice, what we've seen with some of the earliest HDR displays is they range somewhere between the 2,000 and 4,000 nits. Uh, but as we see this display technology advancing over the next couple of years, we're going to expect more and more displays to have higher and higher nit counts. And it gives you a lot more capability as a content creator to take advantage of that. Today, due to the clamps that are applied on uh, Rec. 709, uh, a lot of times we have to fake these effects. So we'll add things like bloom, we'll add things like lens flare. With new high dynamic, high dynamic range displays, you actually don't need to do that anymore uh, because basically you have the capability of actually uh, increasing the brightness of individual pixels or individual uh, segments of a screen. So you no longer have to have the dramatic bloom or um, your visual effects look a lot brighter and a lot more crisp and 
to be honest, a lot more real due to this expanded space. So there's a huge amount of capability that uh, this gives us here. And then when we talk about the wide color gamut, uh, if you've never seen this uh, graph before, this basically represents the entire color space that the human eye can actually perceive. And if you look at Rec. 709, this is basically the color space that we're constrained to. And what this makes, uh, what this really does is it makes it difficult for us to recreate some of the best colors that you've seen uh, in the real world. For example, Ferrari Red is a really hard color to sort of emulate in this color space. The other example is uh, a fluorescent orange traffic cone. Everybody's seen one, we all think we know exactly what they are, but have you ever tried to actually recreate this in a game? It's actually impossible to recreate that, uh, the same color in the Rec. 709 color space. And then when you look at Rec. 2020, we have a much wider color space that we can play with. And you'll notice that the majority of the increase is actually in the green space, and that's because the human eye actually can perceive green much, more, uh, much better than a lot of the other colors. You'll also notice that the tristimulus tri primaries, uh, basically the points of the triangle, they've actually changed as well. So if you're already using a physically-based renderer, um, to actually add HDR and wide color gamut support is actually relatively trivial. Uh, because you're already generating a lot of the HDR data, and then during your tone mapping pass and your color grading, you're actually clamping it down to Rec. 709. But with the new HDR displays, you actually don't have to do that anymore. So we've provided some information to some of our partners about how you can take your existing rendering pipeline, and with a minimal amount of effort, you can take advantage of this full capability. And often what we've seen is, the actual engineering work is less than a week, and there's not a lot of content rework that developers have to do to take advantage of this. So this is an area that we're really excited about as we move forward, um, and we fully expect as the adoption of HDR and wide color gamut displays increase over the next couple of years, we expect more and more games will start taking advantage of these capabilities. The next area that we focus on is the unified tool chain. Um, and like I've said a couple times, our goal is really about providing a single tool chain regardless of the target platform that you're targeting your game at. That tool chain is uh, built primarily on Visual Studio 2015. Uh, as we've taken a look at sort of the AAA game scale, uh, computation loads, compiler loads, linking times, we've seen between a five and eight times uh, faster uh, performance on Visual Studio 2015 versus Visual Studio 2013. And Visual Studio 2015 has full support for cross-device cross UWP and Xbox development, so we recommend all of our game development partners to move to Visual Studio 2015 as fast as possible. We're also providing a single uh, ingestion pipeline with the Universal Dev Center. Um, so it's a single ingestion portal for both Xbox One and Windows 10. And today you're using the Universal Dev Center for your Windows 10 experiences. We have a separate pipeline for the Xbox One. So if you were to release your title or an app on Xbox One, we have a separate ingestion title. And we're in the process of actually converging those into one experience. And then Xbox Live configuration will also be moving uh, to UDC as well to make sure that, once again, it's one set of tools that you use regardless of the device you're targeting. And then for larger game studios, we strongly recommend moving to Windows 10 for uh, active development. Uh, but at the same time, too, we know enterprise level uh, studios, oftentimes it takes a while to actually roll out new operating systems. We're not the only uh, tools that they rely on. Uh, so we're continuing to support Windows 8.1, but we do recommend people move to Windows 10 so you can take advantage of the new capabilities that Windows 10 brings. And then we've uh, talked previously about the fact that we're in the process of merging the Xbox and Windows Store, and that'll be complete later this year. So it's one store, it's one ingestion pipeline designed for the needs of game developers. Um, and like I said before, the Universal Dev Center is the single ingestion and configuration portal, regardless of the device you're targeting. And by converging these two stores, what we're really doing is we're taking the best of the, Xbox, the, best of the features from the Xbox store that game developers have come to need and require, and the best of the Windows store and bringing them together so that you have one set of capabilities that work across all the devices in the ecosystem. So features that game developers absolutely require that are now coming to the Windows store include things like durable DLC support, bundles, subscriptions, pre-order, 
more flexible pricing and agility, especially for titles that are, say, free to play uh, or are much more dynamic in their offer matrix. And then at the end of the day, what this is really about is really about enabling new scenarios across Xbox One and PC. When we think about uh, players moving between multiple experiences or moving across devices, we want to give the tools to developers to really enable them to monetize uh, their title in a way that makes the most sense based on the play style, based on the genre, based on their player base. Um, so let's talk about Xbox Live. Um, you know, I've talked a lot about sort of unifying the client experience, unifying the, the, the tool experience. Xbox Live is our connective tissue across all the devices in our uh, ecosystem. And we do have one of the largest and most vibrant and engaged gaming social networks uh, in the industry. People who play on Xbox Live tend to play longer, they tend to monetize more, and they tend to enjoy their experiences much more than what we've seen with other uh, uh, gaming social networks. So there's really three major areas that we're investing when it comes to Xbox Live. First and foremost is really about uh, making significant investments, increasing the reliability and availability of Xbox Live. At the end of the day, when it comes to gaming, you're really fighting over people's discretionary income and their discretionary time. And when people want to play, they just want to play. They don't want to have to worry, is Xbox Live up? Or is there, uh, is there individual titles matchmaking up or down? So we're spending an inordinate amount of resources to make sure that Xbox Live is the most reliable gaming network possible, both for you as a developer, but also for your players. Another area that we're focused on with Xbox Live is really about making integration much easier for developers. So we do have a single Xbox Live SDK that works across both PC and console. So the exact same APIs and the exact same calling patterns that you use on PC will work on console and vice versa. So if you've already done Xbox Live integration on uh, one of the platforms, all that code uh, is portable over to the other platform. The other thing is, is Today, we offer a lot of uh, flexibility for developers on how you use our matchmaking system, how you use our um, leaderboard system, our stat system, but there's a lot of key scenarios that all games will run into, such as how do I find out what the status is of all my friends? Who's online? Who's available to play? And there's a number of these key scenarios that we're really focused on making just much easier for developers to integrate. If you still want to take advantage of the full suite of low-level APIs, you absolutely can do it. But if you're not really focused on optimizing your multiplayer flows or you don't have really unique scenarios, it should be much easier to integrate these capabilities across multiplayer or peer-to-peer -peer networking or the ability to access the social graph. And then we're also focused on giving developers much better tools to understand how they're calling Xbox Live and why they might see, be seeing longer wait times or timeouts or things like that. So we introduced a tool called the Live Trace Analyzer, and that's available across the platforms, regardless of uh, which device that you're targeting. And then the last thing that we're doing is we're really focused on delivering new capabilities and features uh, to our players and to you as game developers. And when we prioritize and think about the features that we're going to add to Xbox Live, we're really focused on how do we drive engagement, retention, and monetization. We want to make sure that the players who are engaging with your IPs and with your franchises, they have a great experience, they're engaged longer, they stay in your experiences, and then you have the opportunity to monetize them in the ways that make sense with your franchise. And then a few weeks ago, we also uh, added, or we also announced our support for cross-network play. Um, so basically what we're really focused on is providing you and your players the largest player pool, regardless of where they've come from. So, you know, if you want to go ahead and matchmake and people are on other gaming networks, we'll go ahead and support it if you have uh, your, uh, the right matchmaking uh, infrastructure in your studio. Uh, obviously, we don't own the decisions from the other networks, but we do strongly encourage you, if this is an experience that you want to deliver, to talk to uh, the other networks that you're using, and we'll have a conversation. The first title that's going to release using cross-network play support is actually Rocket League, which has been hugely successful on PC, as well as Xbox One, as well as other platforms. And we're really excited to learn from their experience as we work through this, uh, being one of the first titles to take advantage of this. And we'll parlay that knowledge into sort of how we think about this moving forward. And then nobody can uh, really talk about um, online gaming without recognizing the impact that competitive gaming is having on the entire gaming industry. 
Everything from small local organized community tournaments or LAN parties, all the way up to the largest esports events. You know, this is really a fundamental shift in the industry, and people are really thinking about esports when they're designing their titles, or even retroactively, they're looking at their titles and they're trying to say, hey, is there a competitive aspect to this that I could take advantage of, knowing that there's this movement in the industry? And if you look at our first party studios, this is an area that we've been playing in for a while ourselves. Everything from the Halo Championship Series to the Gears Esports Pro League to even titles like Killer Instinct Season 3, which is one of the titles that's available at the uh, annual EVO event, uh, which is one of the biggest fighting game community events uh, that exists. So we've done this for a couple of reasons. One, these franchises naturally align to sort of the competitive gaming nature of these kinds of events. But the other thing too is we wanted to learn from the space and we really wanted to understand what the opportunities were and how could we make this easier for developers and our players. As well as if you look at last year, we released uh, what we would say would be the best competitive gaming controller ever made uh, with the Xbox Elite wireless controller. It's really about showing our commitment to our players across hardware, software, and services. We want to give them the best tools possible to have the best competitive gaming experience on our platforms. And then this led us to uh, an announcement that we had uh, at GDC last week or the week before about adding a new Xbox Live tournaments platform to Xbox Live. And this is an easy to integrate tournament platform all powered by Xbox Live and the Xbox Live social graph. One of the key benefits of this platform is that through a single integration through the Xbox Live tournaments platform APIs, it opens up a whole series of new scenarios uh, that are not available today. If you are a small developer, but you are really great at running your own community events and you have a great community event team, you can run your own developer-defined tournaments. If you have a publisher and your publisher has a strong community team or maybe they have um, an existing esports division or department, you can, your publisher can run tournaments on your behalf. Or if you choose to, you can actually go ahead and partner with some of our first uh, industry-leading tournament operators that are integrating with this platform. And we announced both Faceit and ESL as our initial partners here. And we're continuing to talk to all the industry-leading tournament operators so that you as a developer have the ability to choose how you want to run your tournaments with minimal to zero code changes once you integrate with the Xbox Live tournaments platform. There is a preview SDK that's available uh, for developers to uh, take a look at today. And we have a number of titles who are actively integrating this into their titles that we'll release later this year. Um, and as we go ahead and see the first wave of titles, add more tournament operators and get more partners uh, on board with this, we fully expect that we will continue to grow and develop this capability over time to really make sure that we are the best competitive online service uh, for players uh, and for developers. And then this morning we announced the Xbox Dev Mode activation. Uh, this is a huge milestone. And it's really about enabling Xbox One to support full UWP development. And it gives you the ability to convert your retail console that you bought at the store and turn it into a developer kit. And it's really ideally targeted at application developers and for personal game development. Um, and this allows you to bring your existing uh, Windows 10 UWAs to the living room. We have a massive install base across uh, a number of devices in the living room, and it's really about you know, lighting up your UWAs on the television screen in the shared space in the living room. So the developer preview is available today, um, and I highly recommend uh, you go home, for those of you with an Xbox One, download the uh, developer um, dev mode activation app, and really take advantage of it and start, uh, start playing with it and providing us feedback on what works, what doesn't, how, what's your experience like. So when we talk about what's available in the developer preview today, you know, all XAML uh, controls already support keyboard, mouse, touch, and controller. So if you already have an existing UWA that's optimized for a three-foot experience or maybe touch, it will just start working on your console as soon as you deploy it to your console. With that being said, we highly recommend everybody optimizes and tailors your UX for a 10-foot user experience. Obviously, if you've designed your user experience around a mobile device, now when you're running on a 65-inch TV, it might not actually uh, work as well as you expect, or maybe the uh, nuances of controller input, maybe your UI uh, needs to change a little bit. 
Um, and then we're uh, going to allow UWP apps to be distributed later uh, this summer on Xbox One. There's a talk tomorrow uh, at 5 p.m. in uh, Marriott Salon 8 about how you can optimize your existing UWA to take advantage of the new 10-foot experience. Um, so I highly recommend anybody who has an existing UWA that you're planning on bringing to the P, or I'm sorry, bringing to the Xbox One, I highly, highly recommend you take a look at that talk uh, because there's a lot of best practices that we've developed over the years of really how do we build great uh, user experiences for the living room. So if you want to get started, it's actually really, really easy to go ahead and get started. So first things first is you've got to gain access and set up your account. So if you're already a member of the Windows Insider program or if you already have a Windows Dev Center account, you're good to go. You have everything that you need on that front. If you don't, please go out to the Universal Dev Center and go ahead and set up your account and join the Windows Insider program if you're not a member. Next, you've got to download the latest developer preview tools. So Visual Studio 2015 Update 2, as well as the, uh, uh, the latest Windows Insider SDK preview for the anniversary update. If you download those uh, tools, that gives you all the SDKs that you need to take advantage of the new capabilities on the console. Then, if you go out to the Xbox Store today, you'll be able to do a search for the Dev Mode Activation app. Um, it's a free app that you can go ahead and download into your console. When you go ahead and download the Dev Mode Activation app and launch it, it's going to uh, go ahead and update your system OS. Um, and then, then you'll be able to switch into Xbox Dev Mode to enable UWP development. As Ashley Spiker showed in the keynote this morning, once you've downloaded the update, once you've downloaded the app, you can easily switch back and forth between retail and dev mode with one button click. All you do is you go ahead and say you want to switch, the console reboots, and it'll go ahead and reboot into the proper mode. And then just start development. Uh, it's as easy as adding the remote IP address of your Xbox One to Visual Studio, begin coding, and when you deploy, you deploy just as you would to any other remote device. So there's not a significant amount of ramp up, there's not a, you know, a lot of hoops you have to jump through. It's really about just taking the existing tools that you're using today to write your UWPs, and then just take advantage of the fact that you now have a remote uh, device connected to your living room that you can uh, go ahead and show your experience on. So with Xbox Dev Mode, uh, one thing to be aware of is that you're actually operating in shared system resources when the Xbox Dev Mode is enabled. Uh, the UWAs that are running in this mode uh, share resources with the core OS as well as other apps that are on the platform. And multiple apps can run simultaneously at the same time uh, in the background. So it is the responsibility of developers to handle PLM events, uh, such as you know, your app being suspended, uh, or your app going into constrained mode. Um, and these are a lot of concepts if you've ever done any phone uh, development. The same concepts apply to these apps running on an Xbox One. If you look at the developer preview that's available today, you'll see here's the resource, uh, resources that are available to you as a developer. These are the exact same resources that are available to apps on Xbox One today. Um, so it's the exact same um, resources that are available. You, as long as you work within those constraints, your app should go ahead and run fine on an Xbox One. As we move towards the final release later this year, we're actually increasing the resources available to apps. You'll see that we're moving from 448 megs all the way up to a full gig of memory. Today, um, apps get access to two CPU cores. Later this year, you'll have access be to between two to four CPU cores. So it's really about, you know, we're starting today by allowing you to bring your UWPs to the console, and then we'll go ahead and expand the surface area and the capabilities of this over time as we get further and further into this program. There is an exclusive, par uh, an exclusive partition available on the Xbox One. Uh, it does require the Xbox SDK. If you don't have a publisher or if you're not an established Xbox One developer today, uh, ID at Xbox is actually your path to get access to the full Xbox SDK if your title requires further access to the direct hardware or uh, expands beyond the uh, constraints that exist in the UWP dev mode. And when we talk about ID at Xbox, 
Um, you know, ID at Xbox really is the easiest path for self-publishing for independent developers. When you join the ID at Xbox program, you receive a monthly newsletter with all the latest updates, all, all kinds of tips and tricks about how to make your game better, develop the best in practice development processes, you know, how do I monetize my title? How do I make sure that my title gets the visibility? The idea at Xbox team is really designed to, you know, be your advocate to help you be successful with your game. And since we launched ID at Xbox a number of years ago, uh, we have significant developer momentum because we have more than 1,400 developers actively developing titles as part of this program today. And some of these titles are specific to the Xbox One, some are specific to Windows 10, some are actually shipping on both because they, the title really makes sense across both platforms, and they're looking for the largest addressable audience possible. And then we've seen over 200 games shipped via the ID at Xbox program, and as I said, there's many, many more on the way, and we release more and more games every single month, both on Windows 10 and Xbox One via the ID at Xbox program. So ID at Xbox is required if you want to self-publish a game on the Xbox One. Um, basically, you go through a simple process, and it's really about making sure that we protect the integrity uh, of the Xbox experience as well as the IP of other partners that are on the platform. Then we, if you want to access Xbox Live on Windows 10, very similar, we have a series of policies related to Xbox Live to really ensure that we're providing the best gaming environment, the titles are um, adhering to sort of our parental uh, settings, our privacy settings, to just really make sure that we continue to maintain that great uh, gaming experience on Xbox Live. And as I said before, if your game ex um, expands beyond the capabilities of what's available to UWPs on the console, the ID at Xbox team can actually get you access to dedicated dev kits as well as the special SDKs required uh, to use the exclusive access on the console. So you can find out more about the ID at Xbox program at xbox.com uh, forward slash ID, as well as in the expo hall, uh, Chris Charla from the ID at Xbox team is there. So if you have any questions about the program, how to get your title there, any recommendations that he has, please reach out to him or go to xbox.com slash ID uh, and you can definitely get into the program pretty easy. And then the last thing is really, you know, our commitments to our game development partners. First and foremost, we're committed to providing the best platform and services for both developers and gamers. You know, one of the things that we really appreciate about in Team Xbox is the passion that our fans have for everything that they consume as well as everything that we do on the platform. It's the exact same thing with game developers. As I said before, we can't be successful as a platform without the support of our game development partners, so it's critically important that we're providing the best-in-class platform to these partners. Um, the other thing is, is we're committed to giving access to the largest gaming ecosystem in the industry. Across 270 million Windows 10 devices, we have some of the most engaged users on our platform, on our services, um, and it's really critically important to us that we're providing the best-in-class gaming experiences on our platforms. We're also committed to unifying our developer experience and our customer experience across the PC and the console. Um, you know, one of the big things that we've been doing over the last 18 to 24 months is really about taking the learnings and the best practices we've developed in the console space and making fundamental changes to the core Windows 10 operating system to make sure that Windows 10 is ideally suited for game development and gamers. And vice versa, we're learning from the, the Windows team and we're making improvements to the console experience to really make sure that we do have that one platform, one set of services, uh, one store, and one tool chain that works for all developers. Um, and it's really critically important to us that as developers, we give you the most efficient, powerful, and easy to use game development tools. You should be focused on how to make your game great, not on the low level plumbing and sort of the infrastructure that you need to even get your game up and running. You should focus on the thing that matters most and that's making your game fun. And then ultimately, one thing that we take extremely seriously in uh, Team Xbox, uh, because we like to say we have the most passionate fans, when you have the most passionate fans, you get a lot of really good feedback. You also get some not so good feedback. But we absolutely critically uh, value that feedback. And as I said before, that feedback fundamentally um, alters our roadmap and our plans. Uh, so please, both as a developer and as a gamer, please keep the feedback coming to us. Uh, we value that feedback and we'll make sure that we factor that into our go forward plans. And with that,
I'm done. So I'll go ahead and open up for any questions anybody has. Questions? No, I mean, from our perspective, you know, the, the way I said it earlier today, sure. So the, so the question is, is how do we as Team Xbox think about uh, mobile titles, say, coming to the TV screen or other devices in the ecosystem? And what we're really focused on is providing the best gaming experience as possible. And as we look at our engaged user base across Xbox Live and the players, you know, not everybody is a first-person shooter player or a super competitive player. And, you know, I'll openly say, like, there's tons of more casual, you know, experiences that as long as they're tailored for the 10-foot experience, I think they're great experiences. Uh, the other thing, too, is, you know, when we look at UWP dev mode, a lot of those, you know, with that 448 megs of RAM, with the CPU power that we give, that's actually much higher than most phone experiences anyways. So it's actually a really easy ability for you to port those over and then just really optimize the experience for your players. Uh, but we fully support them, and, you know, we want the best games possible on our platform, regardless of if it's a $300 million AAA title all the way down to a title that you know, a smaller developer put together. Yep. Any other quick, yes? Um, could you address some of the critiques that we've heard about UWPs, like specifically difficulties around modding and, um, you know, setting frame ra rates and VSync and that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, at the end of the day, the way I'll say it is we're early in the journey with UWP as a game development platform. By working with the first uh, and second waves of titles that have uh, shipped on UWP, we've already made significant improvements. Um, and like I said, you know, some of the feedback that we got about G-Sync and FreeSync monitors, the ability to disable V-Sync, what's critically important to us is that we're delivering an experience that meets the needs of the people that, who play on that platform. Console players have a different expectation than PC players. PC players expect different things than uh, mobile touch players. So what we're doing is by working with the best developers in the industry, we're focused on maturing the UWP platform to meet all those needs. Um, so it's absolutely something that, you know, we take that feedback to heart. We've added a bunch of features and a bunch of capability already, but we also know that we have a ways to go. So, you know, Phil talked this morning about aspirations around modding and those capabilities. There are definitely things in our roadmap. We don't have a specific announcement to make today, but that feedback has fundamentally landed with the team, and we're looking at where we can add those capabilities over time. Thanks. Yep. This yep. is uh, probably a can of worms, but yep. um, if w with the developer mode Xbox, more casual developers can make apps, mm -hmm. is that going to be uh, allow side loading? I guess, for lack of a better word. So, if you want to ship a game on uh, the Xbox One, you have to go through the ID at Xbox program for some of the reasons I said before, such as protecting the IP, the integrity of the Xbox experience. Uh, with that being said, if you want to make a game or, for example, like I'm teaching my kids how to program, like I can absolutely convert my retail kit into a developer kit, put the game out there, and if they want to show their friends or bring it over to a friend's house, absolutely. That's totally possible. But if you actually want to distribute your game through the Xbox One store, that's where we recommend people go through the ID at Xbox program. Um, and the ID at Xbox program can help you make sure that your game's successful on the platform. Okay. Yes, All right. uh, yeah, I guess I just wanted to follow up the sort of the modding question a little bit more. I mean, we've, we've had a, a sort of a, a very rich, proud history in PC gaming where we've had like, you know, a game like Half-Life spin off into uh, Counter-Strike or something of that sort, you know, which has been played by millions of people just over and over and over. I mean, can you commit to saying that UWP is going to allow that same flexibility to, I mean, we're not talking about uh, just, you know, skins or something of that sort. We're talking about, like, you know, actual creativity in, mm -hmm. uh, in the industry. I mean, can you commit to a future where we can see modifications of UWP apps spin off into these sort of, you know, beloved franchises? 
It's, it's honestly a difficult question to answer because mods means very different things, title to title, franchise to franchise. Um, you know, some franchises, like you said, you know, Counter-Strike and things like that, that, like there's experiences like that. We're still figuring out what modding means in the ecosystem. How do we deliver it in a way that's safe, that you know, guarantees a great experience? Um, so there's nothing that I can commit to or sort of publicly announce, but it is definitely an area that we're investigating and trying to figure out what is the right experience uh, to be able to deliver to our players. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, cool. Thank you guys very much. I hope you enjoyed day one.